Thank you, Sonia, for inviting me to this uh, workshop. Um, I w I'd like to first acknowledge my uh, collaborator, Taka Takahashi, who's a postdoc in the lab, who uh, has been involved for the past few years on this work. So um, my, I am actually a behavioral, I, I guess I call myself a behavioral neuroscientist, neurophysiologist. So what we want to really understand is the uh, neural correlates of behavior and what, what uh, representations in the brain that tell us something about the behavior of the animal. And particularly, I'm, my focus is on motor behavior uh, of the upper limb, uh, that is the arm and the, and the hand. So that's what I've been studying for the past uh, 15 years or so. And um, I'd like to start by talking about what I sort of see as the beginning of a paradigm shift um, in behavioral electrophysiology. So historically, from the late 60s, uh, when people tried to study behavior and, neuro and neurobiology, uh, typically one designs an experiment which typically involves presenting a stimulus or having an animal do some behavior, mo some motor behavior, or make a decision of some sort. Uh, we then, after that training process takes place, which could take uh, months uh, in some cases, to train an animal to do something. We then uh, stick electrodes in, and historically, one would stick a single electrode in, record from a single neuron, extract uh, data from that single neuron, then repeat the same experiment, uh, move the electrode to a different location, record from a different neuron, and repeat this over and over and over again for many months to collect a large data sample of many neurons. Uh, and then the study ends. And then you analyze each neuron data uh, samples individually, separately from the others. Um, so, it's, so in this paradigm, which still is still quite dominant in the field, one spends relatively little time designing the experiment and analyzing the data, spend a lot of time collecting the data. Uh, in, in the past 20 years or so, people have been developing different uh, multi-channel technologies, um, including multi-electrode arrays. Uh, I'm depicted here one of them, which is uh, the Utah Array, developed by Dick Norman at the University of uh, Utah. It's a uh, it's silicon-based uh, array composed of 100 electrodes where each electrode is separated by its neighbors by 400 microns. And you get a sense of the scale. That's my fingertip. So you can see it's a relatively small, rigid array that's inserted into the brain. And uh, one can then record from the tips, the electrode tips right here, which you can see the tips look a little different in color. Those are uh, metallized. And, and those are the uh, sites where one picks up electrical signals extracellularly. So these are not electrodes that are penetrating cells but in the uh, intracellular uh, space, one can pick up uh, field potentials and then extract information. So with this technology and other similar technologies, the paradigm, oh, and, and by the way, with, these, with this technology, this is the only gory picture I have, uh, one can not only record from one area, so this is one of these arrays, this is a monkey's brain, by the way, exposed, uh, one can implant one site, but one can also in, implant multiple multi-electrode arrays in different sites and therefore understand not only the computations locally within a given cortical region, but uh, interactions between different cortical regions. So with this technology, in this case, we're now recording from 300 different electrodes, and you can imagine how much data we have coming out of that. So this is re resulting in a, in a different paradigm where in principle, one can design an experiment, collect a set of data in one set, you know, one recording session, analyze the data, then design a new experiment, collect some data, analyze the data, and so forth. So in this case, one spends very little time collecting the data, spending, spend a lot of time designing, which uh, presents its own challenges particularly training an animal to do a particular task requires uh, a lot of time. And so that, that hasn't really been solved. In principle, one could go from one, from one day to the next with a completely new experiment uh, in the case of humans, but in the case of animals, it takes a lot more time. 
As far as analyzing data, of course, that also presents a problem, which I'll mention now for the rest of the talk. We now have multi-electrode recordings. One, one doesn't simply analyze each electrode separately, but one can also look at the interactions between different sites. So the challenges we face uh, that might be of interest to you uh, are, first of all, visualizing the data, obviously, characterizing different kinds of patterns, spatial temporal patterns, linking these patterns to behavior, because that's ultimately my goal as a behavioral electrophysiologist, and, uh, and then determining statistically significant interactions about, uh, among neurons. So I'll give you some examples of each type uh, of challenge. But before I do that, let me just briefly mention what's, what's the data that we're getting from these uh, electrode arrays. Uh, so if you look at the top panel right here, this is a typical trace, electrical trace, we'll record from one of these electrodes. And uh, by the way, these, these are the arrays that I'm recording from are recording from the frontal lobe, primarily the motor cortex and premotor areas uh, of the macaque monkey. So here's a typical trace. We're recording at 30 kilohertz, usually tens of thousands of hertz. Uh, and most, most experimenters do, uh, and this is continuously recorded. One can see interesting patterns, for example, these spikes, which are the action potentials from a, from a given neuron. One can also see these slower fluctuations, which are often referred to as local field potentials. In fact, it's kind of a misnomer, this dichotomy between spikes and local fields. They're all local field potentials, but for some historical reason, spikes have their own uh, designation, these, these, these little these, uh, spikes in uh, voltage, those are distinct from the local field, which is typically signals that are uh, below a certain frequency band, and that's typically below 300 hertz. So if you take this trace right here, we high pass filter it, we can now accentuate these spikes and then use different software to analyze the, uh, uh, to identify action potentials corresponding to particular neurons, so-called spike sorting problem. Um, and, and then once we have the spikes, we can basically uh, ignore the rest of the data, the signal, basically the time. So uh, essentially the problem becomes of just extracting these spikes when they occur and the times of these uh, occurrences is, is, is the relevant data. When it comes to the local field, or that is the data filtered below 300 hertz, one now records continuously, one has a continuous signal right here, and here's an example of very, very slow fluctuation below 10 hertz. Here's another fluctuation, which is particularly interesting to me, the so-called beta fluctuation between 10 and 40 hertz. Uh, and one sees the little wiggly lines, uh, so-called oscillations, that are very prominent in motor cortex. If one, um, looks at this local field. Now this is the signal low pass filtered below 300 hertz. Uh, and this is within a particular behavioral context. And what the, in this case, the monkey is performing a task where he's using his arm to move a cursor from a center position here to one of eight possible targets in the periphery. So he's making horizontal arm movements uh, to move a cursor. And this trace is the local field. Zero is when, this, when the target comes on, that is that yellow square where he has to move. The um, dotted line right here corresponds to when the go cue comes on. That's instructing the animal when to start moving. And then that long, uh, the solid line, vertical solid line is when the movement begins. And what you see during this period of time when the monkey is not moving, uh, is this prominent beta oscillation. Uh, so you can see it in the raw local field potential trace, this uh, sawtooth pattern right here. If you now band pass filter between 10 and 40 uh, hertz, one can really see it quite prominently. So it's, it's typically evident during preparation. It's also evident, although attenuated, during movement. Now what's interesting to us is with these solid these rigid arrays, one can not only look at these temporal patterns, but also look at spatial patterns and spatial temporal patterns. So what I've shown you here is 
the array uh, at different time points, and I've color-coded the voltage. This is the voltage in the, uh, in the uh, local field potential bandpass filtered between 10 and 40 hertz. So I'm really accentuating this beta oscillation, which is a very prominent oscillation in, in motor cortex. And I've color-coded it to sort of really uh, show you uh, what's going on in terms of the uh, spatial variations in the beta. And what you can see in this example, over time, this beta is actually showing some sort of progression from the top left to the bottom right as a, as a propagating wave of activity. And um, I want to show you a movie right here, if I can get out of here for a second. Uh, let's see. Um, where is the... Okay, this is... Um, a movie showing you this wave of propagation. What's plotted here now is each, each, elect, each uh, square is one electrode, um, the, just the local field, raw local field potential, bandpass filtered in the beta frequency range. Um, and you can just see it by eye, uh, the patterns that we're seeing. What's plotted on the top right is a, uh, a polar plot that's showing you the instantaneous direction of propagation. Of, of the wave uh, during a, a, a particular trial of behavior. What the monkey's doing in this case is he's preparing and then moving his hand to reach out and grasp an object. Okay, so what's plotted in the lower right is the instantaneous velocity of his hand, of his wrist. Uh, so right now, uh, and, and, and the blue circle is just showing you where in time this uh, he is along this velocity profile. So right now he's just sitting there waiting to reach to grasp uh, an object. And at some point he'll begin the movement and um, he'll increase his velocity, he'll reach a peak, and then he'll decelerate as he approaches the object. And the only point I wanted to make here is we see very interesting patterns of propagation. They typically propagate along this axis right here. So they're propagating either the top right or the lower left. And there's something very interesting that happens right around movement onset, which you probably missed. There, there seems to be a, a, um, a bias such that the waves tend to propagate uh, in, along one direction, right around movement onset. That's, and that direction corresponds to uh, a direction from the front of the brain to the back of the brain, and I'll make that clear in a moment when I get back to my presentation. Okay. Okay. So, so that, so I showed you an example of one kind of pattern that we see, which is this uh, planar propagating activity. We see other kinds of patterns, although they're much less frequent. For example, uh, right here, we see a, an example of a circular wave where it tends to propagate around a circle along the array. Uh, but the most prominent pattern is this planar linear propagation. So we wanted to, we're, we're still trying to understand what the, its significance is, uh, but I'll spend a little bit more time describing how we characterize it. So one way we characterize it is by focusing only on its phase. So we take this voltage signal and we just, using the Hilbert transform, we're just going to focus only on the phase uh, and ignore the amplitude of the signal. And from the gradient of the phase across the array, one can then estimate the instantaneous direction at, at, at every point along the array. And then using this uh, the quantity called the phase gradient of directionality, PGD, what this tells us uh, we get a measurement, a number, a scalar number between zero and one, where one indicates that all the phase gradients are, are oriented along the same direction, suggesting a planar wave uh, across the whole array. Whereas a PGD of zero, or close to zero, would indicate that each local phase gradient is, is oriented in a random direction. Therefore, no consistent propagation direction. So by using a threshold of PGD, one can then extract only 
waves that uh, consist of planar activity. And that's what we've been focused on right now. Uh, and if one uses a PGD threshold of 0.5, which is relatively high in our data, one sees that planar wave activity consists of a wave occurring in one of two directions. So this is a histogram showing the direction, the distribution of directions along one of two directions. Uh, a strong peak in one direction and another peak in, in, in exactly 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And if you plot those modes in, the, in that bimodal distribution, one sh uh, plots out an axis along the brain. This is the central sulcus right here. Uh, this is the front of the brain, the arcuate sulcus. So we're look this way is the front, this way is the back. This is somatosensory cortex, motor cortex, and this is premotor cortex. Each uh, plot here is from one different monkey, and one can see the axis is typically oriented orthogonal to the central sulcus, or in other words, propagating along the rostral caudal axis. In premotor cortex, we see a different pattern uh, where it typically propagating along an act, a bimodal axis in the medial lateral direction. So, so that's, that's one way we characterize these waves, um, but any other help we could get from, from the community to, to, to quantify these patterns would be very useful. Now, the second challenge is trying to link this, these patterns to behavior. And one, one approach one can use is information theory, uh, where one uh, conditions on each behavior. So for example, in one task, we had the animal reaching out and grabbing different objects, okay, of different shapes and different sizes. And so can, we can condition the data on each kind of object that monkey was gonna reach for and look at the distribution of waves, wave directions, and use information theory to say, well, is there differences in uh, propagation direction for each of the object types? And what's shown here is that right around movement onset, which is zero right here, one sees a, 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 a transient increase in information. That is, there, is di there are differences in wave uh, propagation directions that characterize what kind of object the monkey's gonna reach for. One sees a second peak here, this is at the end of movement, after the object is being touched. Okay, then finally, I wanted to talk about um, uh, determining uh, statistical interactions between single neurons. And now this, instead of looking at local fields here, now we're gonna be looking at spikes, individual spiking patterns among a collection of neurons. And, and one approach we've taken in the context of these waves is by looking at uh, each of the neurons spiking activity. So imagine we have a collection of neurons, X1 to Xn. This is the firing rate of a neuron measured of neuron one at time T. And what we do is we develop, uh, we're trying to come up with a, a statistical approach to determine functional connections between neurons. And using uh, an approach uh, from economics uh, called Granger causality, one can try to infer, if we could predict the response of neuron one based on the response of neuron N at some time point in the past. If this past activity can predict the future activity of neuron one, we would then determine through some statistical test that this causes, in quotes, causes or predicts the response of neuron one in the future. And, and I'll, actually I'm gonna skip this, I'm gonna just end with this figure. So what we've, we've applied this approach. This approach allows us to uh, come up with directed graphs of connectivity. And what's plotted here is a, such a directed graph. Uh, this, is, this is data from one monkey, a second monkey, and a third monkey. Uh, this, this is a different task now I'm looking at. I'm not looking at reaching to grab objects, but rather reaching in a 2D plane, just like the first task I told you about. And I'm looking at two different time windows. One time window is before the stimulus comes on to tell the anim animal where to go. And this window is when the, after the stimulus comes on. Now the monkey's given the stimulus, is preparing and executing the movement. And one sees a, a variation in this uh, 
connected graph as a function of time before and after the stimulus. That's the first thing to note. Um, the second thing to note is if one now plots in a polar plot the distribution of directed connections um, and uh, along now along space along the cortical surface, one sees that this distribution of directed connections is not isotropic. And in fact, it shows an orientation which is actually quite consistent with the, uh, the wave propagation axis I mentioned before. So the wave propagation axis is shown by this CW, RW axis right here. And you can see this distribution of connections is uh, oriented along that axis. And that seems to be true for these other two monkeys as well. Finally, if one looks on this panel right here, one can break up these connections based on the sign of, of, the, of the functional connection, whether it's excitatory, that is it's positive or negative, uh, if one looks at the excitatory connections, they seem to be oriented along the axis of propagation. The inhibitory or the negatively weighted connections seem to be somewhat oriented orthogonal to that axis. So we're trying to make sense out of this, uh, both at the local field potential level as well as the spike, uh, spiking level, as to what this wave, is this simply an epiphenomenon? Uh, such as, you know, Barry Richmond, who's in the audience, would argue this is simply an epiphenomenon. I actually think it has some more interesting uh, implications for behavior. So I'll finish there and take some questions. Thank you. Yes, right, right. So we're, we're doing that right now, in fact. We're using um, so-called ECOG grids. Uh, these are electrocorticograms. These are arrays of electrodes that are actually sitting on the brain, not in the brain. And their space, their, the, 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 their spacing is much broader. And we've implanted one monkey that encompasses a much larger area. Uh, and we're, we're beginning to analyze that data. So. There's another scale, there, not another scale, but another dimension that we, I've ignored, which is also interesting, which is the, uh, the third dimension, which is depth along uh, the, the depth of the cortex, which is something I also am interested in. And there are technologies now being developed, such as by NeuroNexus, where you now have three-dimensional arrays that are recording not only in 2D space, but also along the shank of the electrode in the third dimension. Is there any uh, functional topography in the area that you're recording? Yes, right. Well, that's, that's the obvious question. And, and, and uh, we haven't, uh, historically, uh, the, in that area, people have documented a topography, and, uh, um, and, and, namely a somatotopy. Um, so, um, well, it, it's complicated. It's, some people argue that Unlike, it's clear in sensory cortices, there's a very strict topography or, or stricter topography. In motor cortex, there's a controversy. But yes, some people argue there is a, a somatotopic organization and we're trying to understand the relationship between this, this anisotropy of wave propagation and the topography. But we could talk about it in more detail. It's, it's not trivial. Maybe to comment on that yeah. because there might be the question whether this is so variable, did the monkeys do all the same task? And why did this pattern look so different? So the, the spatial an anisotropy, that wave axis, actually is quite consistent across behavioral tasks. So, I mean, the details might vary as to uh, the dynamics of, you know, I show you the dynamics over uh, as a function of time. The, that, that might vary with tasks. But the overall spatial anisotropy, that rostrocaudal axis, is quite consistent over, we've now tested at least three different tasks. And by the way, we've also tested it in a human uh, with this Utah array in motor cortex 
uh, through a, sort of an accident of, of, a, of a, as part of a clinical trial, we were able to show a similar kind of axis in human motor cortex. Um, hi, so this looks like wonderful data and it looks like the uh, electrophysiology is finally moving to high throughput. Um, this is fantastic. Um, have you considered what to do with your data if you want community contributions? Have you made any of this data available to the community yet through a, a platform like uh, Carmen or, or any of the others? Um, I, I'm open to it. I'm f open to sharing the data. I've, I've been, whenever anybody's contacted me, for the most part, I don't think I've ever rejected anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm collaborating quite extensively with different people who ever want to look at the data. In fact, I'm, work, I'm collaborating with Rob Cass here, who was interested in this data and, and from a statistical point of view, and I, I've been sharing it. So, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very welcome to sharing it. But I haven't provided the data to a, a platform that's, that's well documented. So, by the way, I mean, this electrophysiological data is not, you can't just take the data and run with it without really understanding what, what's going on. And, and it's not I, don't, I'm not, I haven't annotated the data and provided a context. And you need to know that context to really understand it. Well, in fact, the collaboration started with one of the students in Carnegie Mellon going up to your lab. Yeah, coming to my lab and, yeah. Okay, I think we will come back to this question. And I, let's thank the speaker again and let's move on. To <laughs>